So, guys, today we're here with Gabe Gabriel, a contractor engineer for NASA. So we actually uh, ran into him here uh, in Brazil. Although he's been here many times, he's going to tell us a little bit about that. And uh, we're going to ask him some general questions here and things that uh, I think you guys would find interesting, especially about like the the what it's like to work at NASA and like what happens uh, uh, like in the planning areas and stuff and stuff that you, you usually don't get to see on TV maybe. So Gabe, yes. uh, welcome back to Brazil. Thank you so much. Uh, although you're probably almost like a native here because <laughs> you've been here so many times. So uh, what brought you to Brazil this time and uh, what have you thought of, the, of it so far? Uh, well, it's funny, I, I always say that uh, when I talk about the space program and I talk about the shuttle going to the pad, that it takes five hours to go five kilometers. Oh, yeah. And I think here, traveling around the city at night, it takes five hours to go five That's kilometers. That's true. So you, were, you probably arrived in Confines and then you made your way to here. You arrived at the international airport directly, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, that's a long drive. But it, that wasn't so bad. It was just getting around in the evenings. It's like Sao Paulo. Traffic is insane, and ah. so it takes a very long time to go anywhere. But I meant it in a kidding way. And it's just part of any big city. You have a lot of traffic. And what other places have you been to in Brazil? Uh, well, I've been to Natal, uh -huh. and I've been to Montes Claros, uh -huh. and I've been to Macapá. Ah, cool. uh, Macapá was kind of fun to go there. Uh, I've been to Sao Paulo quite okay. a few times. And uh, I'm not sure of the names of all of the places I've been. Uh, but I actually have well a map. So far. I'm sorry? You're doing well so far yeah. in the pronunciation. <laughs> I actually have a map of Brazil, uh -huh. and my friend uh, Julio, uh -huh. we sat down and we looked at Brazil and the cities, mm -hmm. and we listed all the cities I've been to, and we put a little chart, and we made the name of the cities relative to where they located on Brazil. Uh -huh. So I kind of know where I've been, but I Have really you been to can't. Rio? Yes, I've been oh, to cool. Rio, uh, and I'm going back to Rio next month. Did you go on the Christ, the statue? No, I didn't. I, actually, when we went to Rio, we were doing something called Science Days. Oh. And it was at a mall in Rio, an upscale mall. Uh -huh. And we were there for three days. Oh, cool. And we stayed three days doing Science Days. And then we left, we went back to Sao Paulo. Ah, cool. And uh, so how did you actually get into engineering and ultimately how did you get into working for NASA? Well, I got into engineering uh, through a long course of events. Uh, I, when I do the presentations, I talk to the students and I always tell them, how terrible I did in school, mm -hmm. that I hated school. I really hated school. I love sports. I love the beach. And I grew up by the beach. And all of a sudden, they took me off the beach, and they put me in this box, and they said, read. So I struggled tremendously going through school. I failed almost everything really? going through school. Yeah, I did terrible. And when I got out of high school, I got a job at McDonald's. This was my first job. And, and I realized one thing McDonald's taught me, I thought I could do nothing but play sports. So I thought I was very uh, insecure with anything. Uh -huh. Then I realized I could make burgers, I could make fries, I could do other things besides sports. And so I learned a lot about the ability to have confidence in yourself. And from there, I tried different jobs. I drove a truck, I drove a bus, I was a mechanic. I didn't want to go to university. I did everything I could to avoid university. And one of the jobs I got involved drafting and surveying. So when I was doing drafting and surveying, I was around a lot of engineers graduate engineers, and they would say to me, Gabe, how do you do this? And how do you do that? And in my mind, I thought, why are you asking me? You've been to university, you're supposed to be so smart, how come you're asking me? So I got to learn a lot of people who'd been to university weren't so smart, at least as smart as I thought they were. And I realized if they could do it, so could I. And my hobby is racing cars. I like to race cars, I like to build cars, and you need a good income to do that. So at McDonald's or some of those other jobs, I couldn't generate the income. So even though you really love Big Macs, you couldn't get to where you wanted. <laughs> well, it wasn't so much that I love Big Macs. It was just something to do. Uh -huh. uh, it was the only job I could get out of high school, and I needed to generate an income. Uh -huh. And a lot of my friends were there. So for me, it was great because at McDonald's, you had no tests, you had no homework. I was making burgers and fries. It was a pretty simple thing to do, yeah. and it was a lot of fun. So it really got me in a work environment, in a fun environment. And I never stopped having fun, no matter what Excellent. I did. I really, I developed a lot of confidence early in life. 
And many of it was because I was around these graduate engineers who I thought were so smart and they were asking me how to do things. And I thought, well, if you're so smart, why are you asking me? And I realized maybe they're not as smart as I thought. And if they could do it, so could I. So after 12 years, I went to university at night. It took me eight years at night to go to university. And I went to university for the wrong reason. I went to get a piece of paper because I could not apply for jobs without a university degree. Mm -hmm. But I felt I could do anything, okay. but I couldn't get the chance. So once I got the piece of paper from the university, uh, it gave me many doors to open. But one of the things I did when I was going to university, I was still a poor student. So I struggled in math and science, but I majored in math and science. So I could get maybe a C in math and science. And my goal was when I started university, I wanted to have a B average. I thought a B or what we call a 3.0. If I could maintain that, it would help me not only to get indoors, but it would be more of a positive uh, spin on what I could do. So I found out I could do well in English and writing. So I took a lot of English and writing classes in university. And I could get an A in English class or writing class, and I could get a C in a math and science. You put them together, you that had to be. Yeah. And so that's how I got through school with the B average. But inadvertently, I learned to write really well. And one of the things I had to do in many jobs was write reports. So writing is very, very important. And through my Air Force career, I had to write many reports, and I got more compliments on the writing of the reports. So when did the Air Force kick in, kick in there? Where, what part? Uh, well, actually, when I got out of high school, I joined the Air Force. Okay. And in the Air Force, I was driving trucks and driving buses oh, and doing okay. all these kind of okay. things. So I kind of progressed within the Air Force, and I actually went to university while I was in the Air Force. Oh, cool. What would be like, what is the most common question you get asked when you travel around the world and give these lectures? Yeah, I th especially in Brazil, the most common question is, how can I get to NASA? Okay. I, I've never seen anywhere in the world fascinated with NASA like Brazil. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I just know that the Brazilians love NASA. And I always say to myself, sometimes I go to uh, presentations and six or 700 people come to see me. And I'm just an engineer, an average guy with an average job, but it's in a really cool place. I think it's because they want to know how you made it in there. Like, what do you, you have to do to actually get there? Like, this guy must be special because how did he make it to NASA? Because it's like, the, you know, like, oh, only the smartest people yeah, get into NASA. Right. So how did you make it? You know, what's, I'll tell you the joke, the constant joke here with NASA in Brazil. So it's something I think only Brazilians know. Uh, Br Brazilians are very ingenious in getting stuff, like creatively fixing problems. So uh, we call it gambiarra here. Have you ever heard of that? No. So it's like a way of doing something the wrong way, but getting it fixed. <laughs> okay. So for example, let's say uh, you see that table there with the paper stuck under there. <laughs> yes. So they sometimes Brazilians do, do things that get stuff fixed that yeah. they say, this guy's a genius, he should go to NASA. You know, okay. and they post pictures of the these uh, creative ways they find of fixing yeah, things. Interesting. And they're like, oh, NASA should come study Brazilians because yeah. look at this. Only a, a genius could fix this with like gum and silver Very tape cute. or duct tape. So that's a constant joke here with the NASA thing. One of the ways they promote me sometimes in Brazil is they say, hear Gabe's story from McDonald's to NASA. Oh, and, that's interesting. And they promote me many times at speaking events that way. And so when you say, I'm at NASA and I worked at McDonald's, they can't conceive of that being possible. There's no way that anybody who once worked at McDonald's could get to NASA because if you worked at McDonald's, you would never have the ability to then work at NASA. And so one of the things I try to do is tell people, everybody is just the same. The reason that you get to NASA, it's usually so you have good experience. You have to be good at what you do, but you have a lot of experience. And that's what gets you in NASA. But NASA has always been elevated to above and, and better than anything else, especially relative to science. But within the last 20 years, especially maybe the last 10, there are now commercial companies that are doing the same as NASA. Uh, it's, it's gotten much broader. It's not just NASA. And mm -hmm. when I talk to students who want to go to NASA, I tell them, well, you know, you can go to a commercial company. So there's many, many competition, much more competition now 
20 years ago, it was only NASA. If you didn't work for NASA, you couldn't do anything with space. But now you can do a lot more outside of NASA. And NASA is actually looking at the commercial industry to help NASA because of funding. It costs so much money to do things, NASA is government funded. So it's kind of limited in some ways. If there was a mission to Mars, uh, would you go? If they needed an engineer to go to Mars, would you want to go? What do you think? It's a very tricky question because I would love the opportunity to go to space. I would love to feel what it's like to see a launch, be on a launch, and, and have experienced that. So would I want to give up three years of my life just to go to some place where I can't really do anything that I enjoy doing. You can build stuff. It's going to be very, very difficult. It will maybe 300 years from now, you could go to Mars and have an environment similar to Earth. But for the next 50 or 100 years, you're going to be in a very hostile environment. So could we say after they get all the beaches set up there and, the, <laughs> and then you would go? Yes. Okay, good. So he would actually go after everything set up. So Elon Musk, when you get everything set yeah. up, send an email to Gabe. You'll go there. I'll have my backpack. You'll get, give some lectures on Mars. Yes. That'd be cool. Yeah. For us to colonize space faster, in your opinion, what is the biggest change we would need to make to the way things work in the world today? How could we make things faster? How could it speed up the process? Well, you have to invest a lot more in technology. Uh, right now, they don't have the technology to do that. And the only way you can do that is through research, R&D, and a lot of people doing a lot of things would take a tremendous amount of money. So do you think we need more of like a global effort for that, like everybody working in the same direction? Or do you think it'd be better if it was like a competition where, you know, like, like, like what's happening now with uh, SpaceX and... Uh, uh, Blue, Origin. Yeah, yeah, Blue Origin, what do you think is better? Like a, a, a global initiative, everybody works together, or something like whoever gets there first gets the most profit? Well, sadly, money is usually the driver of everything, and competition is always good. I think when you have competition, you, you have try harder. You have more incentive to do well. Uh, I had one of the most interesting questions was ever asked to me uh, was in America by a 10-year-old boy, and he said to me, Gabe, how come all these astronauts from these different countries can go up on the space station and get along and work together, and we can't do it on Earth? And I thought from a 10-year-old that was pretty, pretty uh, impressive thought. Question. What was your answer? I, I said because they have a common goal. They're up in space, and they're all working towards a common goal, and they know they can do better together than individually. Uh, so this one is a good one. Uh, you actually got to see a space shuttle launch live? Yes. So what's that like? Oh, and I talk to the students about it. It's, it's the most magical thing you could ever imagine. And the reason it's so magical is because the space shuttle, it's like an airplane, but it goes vertical. But it's much more powerful. Mm -hmm. So the shuttle has about 3 million uh, kilos of thrust. So this is 3 million kilos pushing against the Earth. So when you get in a plane, and I talk to the kids, you get in a plane at the passenger terminal, you get on the plane, you go on a taxiway to a runway, and you stop. And they rev up the engines, they build up power as a pilot, you know, until you build up enough power, you take off horizontally. Well, the shuttle does the same thing vertically. So when it's on the launch pad, it's clamped down, and they start the engines, and they're building up power. It builds up to 3 million kilos of thrust. So when it's locked down on this launch pad, and it's trying to take off, it literally shakes the earth. You can feel a vibration in your feet. You can feel it in your body, and you can't really touch it or see it or hear it, but you feel it in the air. There's nothing like it. And when it launches, it's just magical. It just lights up the sky, and the sound, I could never describe the sound. It's like a banging, clanging. It's just amazing sound. And it's super cool because with the vibrations of it trying to take off, it vibrates everything. So all of the car alarms go off. So you have the alarms going on in the car, you have the horns honking, the lights flashing, you have all this crazy magical stuff, you're feeling a vibration in your feet, and this thing shoots off amazing. So the first time I saw one, I thought, wow, I want to see this. I'd like to see this and get involved in it. Cool. Um, how important is English for you to actually work at NASA? Well, that's one of the things I talk to kids all the time. You can't work at NASA, you simply cannot work at NASA unless you speak English. And you have to be an American citizen 
to work at NASA. So one of the biggest challenges I talk to kids, especially in Brazil, who want to go to NASA, okay, you can go to NASA, I'm not saying you can't, but you have to understand you have to be an American citizen. And you have to ask yourself, how do I get that? So for students, I always recommend university. Uh, America has many, many great exchange programs. That you can go there as a, a bachelor's degree or you can go as a graduate student and they have many programs. So if you can get to America as a student and you can stay as a student and then establish a residency there and stay seven years, then you can apply for American citizenship. And once you get your American citizenship, you can apply to go to NASA. If you can't do it through schooling and you come here and you get an engineering degree, start talking to companies in America that have the engineering field that you're able to do and send them emails, send them anything. I'm a Brazilian engineer, I would like to come to America. What opportunities do you have? Write to every company you can. And maybe you write to 100 before one writes back. And they say, we have a program. You get to America, you get a job, you get again, you establish residency, and you apply to go to NASA. So Gabe, last question here. Uh, what advice would you give to pilots that uh, want to possibly go fly at NASA or Florida or th things along those lines? Pilot, a lot of the astronauts are former pilots. Many are test pilots, and they have a variety of, of flying experience. Because one of the things that an astronaut has to do is maybe fly a capsule. Uh, when these capsules, they're usually computer controlled, but they usually, I believe, and I'm not a pilot, and I don't know a lot about it, but in my, my thought is, you know, they always have a human over, override. No matter what they do mechanically or with computers, they always have to have a human over, override. So if you're a pilot and you've got a lot of diverse experience in flying, you could try to become an astronaut. Uh, many of the astronauts are former pilots. Do any of them speak Portuguese? Uh, Spanish? I would imagine many speak Spanish or Portuguese. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't think that's a limiting factor, but they have to speak English. But all pilots have to speak English, right? Yeah. I mean, when you're flying internationally, English is an international language. So I think all pilots must speak English to begin with, whether they go to NASA or not. But I think probably as a pilot, you have some sort of engineering background, engineering discipline before you became a pilot. I would think so. So you've already got an engineering discipline, you've got flight training, it's a good opportunity if you want to go to NASA to become an astronaut, that would be a great stepping stone through your engineering ability and your flight training ability. But okay, so I want to thank Gabe for coming and talking to us. Welcome him back to Brazil again for the 31st time, right? No, no, 13th. 13th, <laughs> 13th time. And... Uh, if you guys like this, I'm going to leave Gabe's info so you can send him an email or something, sure. right, to get him. He gives a lot of lectures and stuff, so we'll leave his information in the description of this video. If you like this video, remember to like it and subscribe to our channel, and you'll get more stuff like this. Uh, so thanks a lot, Gabe. You're welcome. Muito obrigado.